outcome for the work that we do. So they'll take that fish and eat them. And we have a great partnership with a program called Stream of Dreams, started in British Columbia and is now probably across most of the provinces in Canada. And the idea being that all the students collectively, their fish get installed into a mural on their chain link fence. Which school, what school doesn't have a chain link fence? Um, and we mount those fish on the chain link fence with parent volunteers to create a message, to remind them that we are all connected. So it's a way of bringing art and environment into practice. So I think the next slide shows us attaching them to the fence. And we'll go to the next slide. Gives you a bit of an idea. And then the, the, the fence is signed with whomever we've received funds for or material donations, that kind of thing. So our challenge with this one school, we had to cut 350 fish. So we had students from Henry Street High School start the project and they ran out of motivation, <laughs> teacher, teacher change, and so we had to cut the rest out. <laughs> my, my colleague Kathy Grant spent a lot of time uh, breaking her husband's blades on his uh, chase. <laughs> so when we met with Dawn and talked about this project, and there are 12 silhouettes that we gave you, 13 silhouettes of different fish species that you will find in our creeks and in Lake Ontario, so we want it to be somewhat accurate. We didn't want to paint cute, or we didn't want to cute cut out fish because the message is there's native fish species, there's a whole economy based on angling, and, and all these things need to work together. So um, we would really like to partner with you to cut fish out. <laughs> so so here, here's where we're at. We need to put a proposal together. And originally, when, when, we, when we thought up this program, uh, or not, when we adopted this program, we thought we'd do five schools a year. After doing one school, we realized we can do two schools a year, one in spring, one in fall, because of all the coordination and organizing effort and I mean, paint in small bottles. It's very labor intensive. Um, but it really works with all of our other education programs. So our goal is to write a proposal we tried TD Friends of the Environment. They weren't fans because they felt it was more of an art program. So we are looking to RBC Blue Water uh, February 15th to submit a proposal. And we think we would probably need 800 fish. So it's no sure. <laughs> Before they go into spasm. 800 fish over the course of two two separate seasons, correct? Yeah. yeah. So 401 yes. session, 400, and then, 400. 400. Yeah. and then and then spring would be when March, April. I would say probably May. May. Given that we're in the sugar bush, March, April street planting. So and yeah, your fall, May, your June. fall would be. Could be October. We did this one in October. So 400 per. Per school. And 13 silhouettes cut out. Different. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's not it's not that bad. It's not that bad. <laughs> With the right equipment, my, my colleague Kathy says it would be easy peasy. <laughs> and what would first you supply the materials or would we, we would supply the materials and the beer, I think. <laughs> You know, we, we've just been working on shop safety. Now you're going to use beer. Awesome. Awesome. Question. Uh, so, that, so that's the size of the fish, correct? Right? Um, there's different sizes. They're in that. Uh, there's 13 oh, different yeah. species there. Actually, do you want to hand them around? That's yeah. I was going to say, could you not, could you make them a little bit smaller? Could you get more out of like a sea yes. of plywood? Yeah. The, the interesting thing is the smaller, the less the light. Grade, the smaller the fish. So the kindergartens get the itty bitty fish, and the grade eights get the monsters. So, so these, these ones get distributed here. <laughs> 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 they can cut, but they can't pay. Yeah, Our guys? Um, <laughs> yeah. 
The other thing we were really trying to do, we have about 50 fish right now in our inventory, and we just put a news release out today. We're A, looking for partners to help us with the program. Um, and the other thing we're going to do is find 50 local artists to paint those individual fish and do a public installation. But we'd love to do it somewhere around City Hall, because Oshawa Creek is right on that location, and would really promote the program and the partnership. Yep. Do you check with continuing education? Continuing education. School. They they have like an art class. Okay. Okay. Uh, sure. There's a lot of art groups in Oshawa, and and so we just put the news release out. We'll see see what well, comes out of it. Gonna do. I'm going to do one. <laughs> <laughs> Patricia's an artist. <laughs> I'll attempt one, but um, yeah, so so that's the Stream of Dreams program. Yep, at the back. Uh, can I trade that beer for rum? <laughs> <laughs> Young men with a sense of humor, I love it. Okay, so that's Stream of Dreams. We'll let you know where our proposals go, but yeah, it would be something we would phase over the next couple of years, and if it's a project that we can get funding for long-term, then it, it might be a long-term partnership. What's your timing at this point when you, when you find out, like when do you think you'll know some of your... The proposal deadline is February 15th, and I would say towards the end of March we would know, so we could purchase materials in April, May. April and then have them ready for me. Yeah. And John has cut out some templates to make life a little easier cutting out the fish and, and there are some standards. I think quarter inch plywood was the preferred well, it's half. thickness, half inch. Half inch exterior, so half inch yeah, exterior. Exterior. Yeah. So by April by April you're thinking so we'd have basically four weeks to get the spring session yeah. completed. Under fish a week. <laughs> Before case <it's> severe. <laughs> <laughs> Question, yes. Yeah, um, with, uh, with relation to all of the different species you're talking about, the fish, uh, the creeks, everything else, um, you mentioned earlier about uh, large projects. What kind of a say do you have when it comes to uh, all of the uh, excavation that's going on with the 407 project? I mean, that's cutting a, a swath straight through everything, the green belt, you name it. Good question. Um, CLOCA was, that's our acronym, CLOCA was part of a team put together by MTO to review and comment because that road crossed, I think it had 80 plus creek crossings. And whenever you put in a culvert or any a, a, a corrugated metal culvert or a big box concrete culvert, um, it requires a permit from the Conservation Authority. And we commented on those documents and the plans, and they didn't listen. They didn't listen. <laughs> they put it bluntly. Yeah. So there's so what's involved in that is there's typically mitigation. So if you're losing, say, a hectare of wetland habitat, it has to be replaced. So that's the, we've been more involved in that process, unfortunately. To me, it's a bit backwards because we should protect what we have in the first place. Um, but the drive for development is stronger than the cry for environment. So we're now looking at how do we, how do we um, incorporate the things that we've lost back into the landscape in that particular watershed is kind of how we look at it. So when you think about things like um, wetland loss, we'll be doing some wetland creation. Impacts to creek habitat, there'll be some restoration. Some, and the biggest thing with our creeks is um, you want a natural edge along those creeks for at least 30 meters. That's 100 feet. That's pretty significant. And, very, and for a health, for a functioning creek system, you want about 75% of your creek shoreline, for lack of a better word, to be treed or shrubbed or natural. And we don't have that. And so in some cases, we're able to take this compensation money and put it into restoring some of those repairing habitats. So it's not the best solution. It's not our preferred solution. But it's what we have to work with. So good question. 
You've seen the trees coming down, the forests and the... I, I've seen farms galore. Uh, they, they take huge barns down the size of this building and they put up a little corrugated shed on stilts for swallows for nesting. It's, We're going to talk about that. Sure it's <laughs> those, right? yes. it's Next on the list. And uh, My wife did a project on, with the Barnes Project and, and the first thing they did was they took pictures of all the barns that were going to be taken up by the 407 before yeah. they did it again. So, so the loss is significant. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a call last week from MTO asking me how our barn swallow habitat projects were working. And I thought, you're asking me? <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot of barns that have disappeared. And whether those smaller structures are a good replacement or not, again, we're not going to know for some time. If that barn swallow population is going to decline. So we have a project to address that too. <laughs> we have a couple old silos. The barns are long gone, um, but we did a workshop in 2013 and we looked at modifying the interior of those silos to create habitat for barn swallows. And the barn swallows just like the ledges in a barn, they like the ability to fly through the barn exit and enter. They're not bothered by human activity per se. If any of you have experience of uh, barn swallows in your barn or um, a friend's barn, uh, they're quite happy. They cohabitate well with people. Um, but the loss of barns is certainly significant in our local landscape as we just discussed. And there's a lot of silos hanging around that really maybe could be repurposed 